Hello, everyone. I'm here with my dear friend and teacher, uh, Deepak Chopra. Um, we're going to be talking about his latest book, which is a really important one. And uh, just pleased to have you with us, uh, Deepak. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great my pleasure. You. My pleasure. Thank uh, you, Jim. So, Deepak, um, maybe we could break this down pretty simply for uh, for for our broader audience. Uh, please give us a, a little bit of background and context around what motivated you to write this book, Quantum Body. So, in 1988, I wrote a book called Quantum Healing, and uh, it was based on my understanding of then, which was a very premature science then, called epigenetics. The book was not well received by the academic uh, establishment, but it did become a bestseller, created a meme called Quantum Healing, etc., etc. Now, um, almost, uh, you'd say, 25, no, 35 years later, we have science, we have neuroplasticity, we have epigenetics, and basically what uh, the new science is telling us is that uh, every experience we have, almost every experience, modulates genetic activity. Only 5% of disease is related to what are called fully penetrant genes. So if somebody has a Baraka gene, for example, for breast cancer, that predicts breast cancer, uh, irrespective. Doesn't matter what you do, that person is going to get breast cancer. No, that's true of not only cancer, it's true of all diseases. Only 5% are due to fully penetrant genes. And for that now, there's new technology emerging. It's called CRISPR, gene editing, etc. But we forget that that will apply only to 5%. The rest, 95%, is modifiable through lifestyle and choices we make every day, including sleep, emotions, relationships, social interactions, food, stress management, biological rhythms, uh, diet, etc. So given the new science, I thought I'd revisit uh, and update uh, what I then intuited as quantum healing to show people that uh, the choices you make every day we eat, we breathe, we digest, we metabolize, we eliminate, we have social interactions and we experience sensory and motor activity. And the choices we make actually either turn the genes on for self-regulation or healing, or they turn them on for disease or inflammation or depression or mental well. Uh, distress. That science is well established. What is controversial still among scientists, and not to me, but among scientists is where does experience happen? So, you know, if you ask conventional neuroscientists, they say experience happens in the brain. But actually, that's just a hypothesis. Right now, uh, as I'm speaking to you, there's no sound in your brain and there's no image of me in my brain. There are what are called neural correlates of this experience. So in the ancient wisdom traditions, they've always said that experience happens in consciousness. So then the next question is, where is consciousness? Because we can't see it and we can't touch it. We can't taste it. We can't smell it. We can't perceive it. But yet without consciousness, there's no experience. Ancient wisdom traditions say consciousness is fundamental. Everything else is a modified form of consciousness. So our mind is a modification of consciousness, which is a field of all possibilities. And so is our perceptual activity. And so is our body. It's a, you know, how do you know you have a body? Well, you experience it in consciousness as your perceptual activity. So given that, I kind of did my own research and said, are there scientists who believe that the fundamental field of all existence, which is called the quantum field, is could it be a consciousness field? Is it a self-aware field? Now, that idea is very controversial. Most scientists will say, you know, you're, you're kind of uh, um, taking this too far. 
that the fundamental reality is just the quantum field. It has nothing to do with consciousness. On the other hand, if we can't explain mind through science, then the science is incomplete because after all, we use the mind to do science. You know, you can't do science without the mind. You can't even experience your body without your mind. So we have to include in some way or another mind and consciousness and emotions in our understanding of fundamental reality. Now, fortunately, I was enough for, I was happy and fortunate to find two colleagues. One is Jack Tuzinski, who's a quantum physicist, and he's also a quantum biologist. And he's recently become interested in quantum consciousness. And the other is Brian Fertig, who's like myself, a neuroendocrinologist, but also has written a book on quantum metabolism. So the three of us teamed up to suggest that the ground of all existence is also the ground of your own existence and it can be actually experienced directly when we transcend um, thought or perception as in meditation or mindfulness or self-inquiry or any of the great uh, wisdom traditions that have speaking about this for thousands of years so you know the book is divided yeah. into many sections some of it is science and some of it is very practical how do you get in touch with the most fundamental aspect of yourself now in religious traditions that's called spirit or consciousness or soul i don't use those words because that then you know becomes very selective only religious or spiritual people will be interested if you talk about soul or spirit but in cognitive science, the word for that is awareness, consciousness. So the book is about tapping into fundamental reality in order to restore what we call homeostasis, self-regulation, healing, etc. Before we uh, continue diving a little bit deeper into uh, your collaboration and, and uh, even defining more what the quantum body means, um, I had one question. Uh, we're talking about consciousness, but what is outside of consciousness? Nothing. How can anything, if the, if something is outside of consciousness, then we don't have access to it. I mean, you know, if there's a reality out of outside of consciousness, we have no access to it. Now, we must define consciousness, not the mind. Your mind is uniquely yours. Right. So it's mine, my mind, and it's my mind is conditioned by culture, by religion, by economics, by history of our ancestors, by our own ev biological evolution. So we have a human mind, but you know, you look at other species, you know, what does the world look like to a bat that only experiences the echo of ultrasound or a snake that experiences infrared, etc., etc. So every biological species has a different perceptual apparatus which allows them to see a different world. And obviously, the mind of a crocodile is not the same as the mind of a human being. Um, but they, all these other species have some kind of mind, otherwise right. they would be living. The common ground of all minds is still this field of possibilities, which we call consciousness. So consciousness is not personal. It is it is a universal domain of awareness with species specific minds and then each species has its own biological apparatus and as a result of it experiences a different universe this is actually right now a topic of discussion it's called the hard problem of consciousness how do neurochemicals and neural correlates or electrochemical firings in the brain create any experience, whether it's sound or form or vision or taste or thought or feelings or emotions. And that problem is called the hard problem of consciousness. I don't think it's a problem because we are assuming that matter creates mind. If right. you just reverse this um, idea that matter doesn't create mind, matter is a construct, a human construct for a human perceptual activity, in a biological species that we call homo sapiens, then there's no hard problem. Consciousness becomes the fundamental reality. Everything else, mind, intellect, ego, 
the body, energy, information, and the physical world uh, byproducts of consciousness. Understood. Um, for our audience, can you explain in the simplest terms possible um, what the quant what quantum body means? Okay, so the word quantum uh, is now over a hundred and what hundred and quantum revolution occurred around 1905. It was formalized, the Copenhagen interpretation was formalized in 1935. And there were many people involved, including Schrodinger, Max Planck, Paul Dirac, Einstein, Niels Bohr. And the findings of quantum mechanics are very counterintuitive. So let's go with basic definitions. A quantum is defined as the most basic fundamental unit in which waves of information and energy are either absorbed or emitted. So a quantum of light is called a photon. A quantum of electricity is called an electron. So there are these particles that make up atoms and they behave in strange ways. They can appear as units of matter, for example, that uh, you know a particle can have units of matter and energy in which case it's a particle but unobserved it's a wave and uh, the wave has no location in space or time so the margin between mind and matter gets blurred and also quantums uh, quantum phenomena until they are measured they exist in superposition which means all e electrons exist along with every other particles before they are measured. Also, there are strange phenomena like tunneling, like um, like superposition, like entanglement. You can have two quantum systems separated millions of miles away from each other, and yet one's behavior affects the other's behavior. If you measure one quantum system, the spin and charge, you immediately know what the other is, even though there's no signal going. So the the you know the quantum mechanics is basically a mathematical recipe and without that we wouldn't have any technology today like you know we wouldn't be able to use this zoom connection without quantum mechanics or do anything on the internet or use instagram or 80 90 percent of our economy is dependent on the math of quantum mechanics but then if you go to wikipedia and you say what does it mean you'll get 35 interpretations. Nobody knows what it means. So the most popular interpretation is called the Copenhagen interpretation, which says until a conscious observer makes a measurement, particles don't exist. They come into existence only when measured. Before that, they are probabilities in mathematical space. Now, that is very counterintuitive, but that's what it is. So right now, there are two theories that are dominant in quantum mechanics. One is the old Copenhagen interpretation, which says consciousness is somehow involved in locating a particle or a space-time event. There's another theory that's become very popular now. It's related to string theories and multiverses, which says that the wave function is actually a physical thing. It's not a mathematical object. It's a physical object, in which case there are infinite universes and infinite versions of you and me. So, you know, forget about all the interpretations. You can go into Wikipedia and sure. you'll realize that, you know, nobody knows exactly what it means. But the quantum body, as we are suggesting in the book, is actually the quantum field. So the quantum field, surrounds us, it's in us, and it pervades all of space-time, and it's timeless, it's eternal. In uh, many spiritual traditions, they say we have a physical body, which is matter and energy. We have something called a mental body, which is mind, intellect, and ego. And then we have a causal body, which in spiritual traditions, they call the soul or spirit. But that's not a fashionable word, soul or spirit in cognitive science. So we can call it awareness or consciousness. And what we are saying here is your quantum body is actually your spirit, which never ages and which is not in time. It recycles as space, time, energy, information and matter. Now, you know, a lot of people will disagree with that, but that's an emerging paradigm. 
And, you know, there's a science conference every year on quantum reality in Copenhagen, headed by Sir Roger Penrose, who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, and Stuart Hameroff. So there are endless discussions on this. And this year, I'm going to be doing a keynote on quantum body as well. I'm uh, fascinated by some of your studies on longevity. Yes. Um, and aging. And I know it connects directly to the study of uh, quantum body. Um, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. You alluded to it uh, just before. How does our understanding of quantum body challenge our conventional views, let's say, on aging, disease, and overall health? Sure. So, you know, right now, uh, health span and longevity have become part of um, the medical literature because the fastest growing segment of the population, at least in developing countries, is over the age of 100. And people are also concerned that as we live longer, there'll be more Alzheimer's and there'll be, you know, end of life care, all of that. So uh, the study of longevity and a healthy aging has become very important. And there's lots of work on that, you know, right? Where if you sleep well, if you manage your stress, if you eat the right diet, etc., a diet that has maximum diversity of plant-based foods and so on. And there are many, 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 um, uh, you know, articles on what creates longevity. And it's right now, there's also a lot of interest in what we call signal molecules or adaptogens, which modulate the effects of stress on a cellular level. But what people are not talking about in the health, uh, in the health span, um, conversations right now is how we experience time so you know in the ancient wisdom traditions they say time is the consumer and we are its food so ultimately it is time that causes aging and how we experience time and you know time the experience of time is subjective you if you have a good time the time flies if you're a dentist time drags if you are if you're nervous you know time doesn't seem to end you're in agony all the time and these days many people say they don't have any time to do anything at all they're always in the time crunch now the way you experience time actually influences your biological clock so if you are rushing all the time and you have what is called time sickness your blood pressure will go up your heart rate will speed up your body will get inflamed on the other hand if you're in love then there's no time whatsoever and then in spiritual experience, time is transcended. So quantum body is saying that there is a domain of awareness which is beyond your mind, which is totally silent. And that is your spiritual body or your soul body, or you call it your awareness body. And when you transcend to that, then because you're not experiencing any time, you can do it through breathing techniques and parasympathetic uh, stimulation as well then you slow down the experience of time, metabolism of time, and your biological clock also changes. So in these wisdom traditions, people don't measure age by the number of years you live, but by the number of breaths you take or in a lifetime or the number of heartbeats in a lifetime. The slower and deeper your breath, the slower your heart rate, the more relaxed you are, the slower the metabolism of time and you will live longer. And we now have studies to show that, you know, in one week of a meditation retreat, the level of the enzyme telomerase, which regulates our biological clock, went up 40%. And, you know, we had a Nobel laureate actually participating in the study. And she was from University of, Cal she is from University of California, um, uh, San Francisco. She won the Nobel Prize for discovering the enzyme that controls biological age. So in one week, we would retreat the enzyme telomerase went up by 40 percent and this was so kind of bizarre that uh, we had difficulty it took us five years to get the paper published ultimately it was published in nature and now many people have replicated that that uh, practices like meditation even prayer actually or silencing your mind or experiencing reflective inquiry interest inspection, sitting quietly, watching your breath, or any way you stimulate the vagus nerve will slow down the metabolism of time and actually increase the activity of the enzyme 
that changes our biological clock. So it took us five years to get it published, but fun finally it was published in a journal called Nature Translational Psychiatry, which is very prestigious. Nature is one of the most prestigious journals. And now those studies have been replicated by other people and are being replicated as well. But I have to say, this is a new science. Um, you, you, you talked about the, um, the connection between energy and time, our own, our own energy. Uh, and you talked about sleep and living a healthy life. Um, I always wondered that if one lives a, a very healthy, conscious life, meditates, um, understands how to breathe properly and how to sit quietly and how to receive everything around us that the world throws at us uh, in the right way because one can manage one's body, mind, emotions, and energy. Is it possible uh, to live on less sleep if one's energy is at a higher level? You know, yes, people have said that, and it's probably true, but I would not recommend it, you know, because sleep uh, actually is one of the best ways for you to return to your quantum body as well. And, uh, the, you know, in sleep, there is no time, as you know, in deep sleep, there's no time. In dream time, of course, time is fuzzy. But deep sleep now has been shown to be very important for preventing heart attacks, for cardiovascular disease, preventing um, cerebrovascular disease, and actually probably the most important factor in preventing Alzheimer's. Interesting. Um the idea of the quantum body, it's, it seems like you're saying it, it, it almost exists or it does exist on a subatomic level. Is, is, that, is that correct? Correct. Um, it exists even before the particles emerge yeah. as a field of possibilities. That's all. It's formless. It has no borders. Therefore, it's infinite. It doesn't have a cause because the ground of creation you know, in religious traditions, you would say it's the mind of God, but these days it's not fashionable to talk about God. Understood. And and so how does that connect beyond? I mean, this this does connect in a lot of ways to longevity, et cetera, and health. But how does it connect specifically um, to our thoughts and our feelings and our sensations and our biological responses, let's say? It is the source of all of that. So when we feel separate from it, we create the illusion that we are separate beings when in fact we are interconnected with all that exists. And so, you know, again, in spiritual traditions, they say we are not alone. We are uh, connected with everything else that exists. We are part of the web of life. And when we experience things like empathy and compassion or love or joy or peace of mind, we are connecting with this field, which is basically the ground of all creation. It is, doesn't have a form. So in Judaism, that would be Ein Sof. In, um, in the Arab traditions, it would be Allah. Uh, in uh, in uh, the Vedic traditions, it would be Brahman. But um, And in the Buddhist traditions, it would be Nirvana. But actually, when you look at the descriptions, in fact, I did once did a whole course on Vedic and Judaic uh, and Buddhist cognition and actually they're all very similar they just use different vocabulary that's all fascinating um how did the prescriptive exercises outlined in the book contribute to uh, the reader's journey and in, in unlocking let's say the uh, secrets of the quantum body On a very fundamental level all the techniques in the book talk about parasympathetic nervous system and you know how to activate that so we have two aspects to our autonomic nervous system the sympathetic nervous system which is responsible for the fight or flight response but then we have another system which is responsible for healing it's called the parasympathetic nervous system and it's also called the rest and rejuvenate response and so all the techniques are about how do you activate this during our world is on sympathetic overdrive. Everybody's fighting. There's war going on. There's terrorism. There are economic uh, disparities in the world. There's climate change. And so all of that collective distress actually uh, adds to what is happening right now in the world, which is sympathetic overdrive. And it has epigenetic consequences. For example, during the Holocaust, when um, the Jewish population suffered starvation in the Netherlands, um, now three generations later, 
their descendants have metabolic syndrome and diabetes because the memory of that starvation is then genetically transmitted through several generations. So right now what's happening in say in uh, Gaza or, or Ukraine, the consequences for that for both sides will be several generations. Um, and that's the tragedy. We are not looking at this in biological terms. If we looked at it in biological terms, then peace is the only way to restore physical and mental well-being. And ultimately also it connects to everything else, including the climate change, including social economic justice, including health, including mental well-being. So if for nothing else, we should start to look at conflict resolution in terms of biological terms. You can't have prosperity without peace. You can't have justice without peace. You can't tackle climate change without peace. And you can't have economic empowerment without peace. So, you know, I think uh, if we just change the dialogue and conversation to what is good for everyone as a humanity. And, you know, it's obvious that peace, prosperity, health, social justice, economic justice, racial justice, and even, you know, our um, ethno ethnic identities come later. We are first human beings before we differentiated into different tribes. So, you know, we need a big paradigm shift to order to solve these problems. But one way to look at war and conflict is just in simple biological terms, it's inflammation. You see, and trauma is the reason for inflammation. The memory of trauma is called anger. Anger leads to hostility, which is the desire to get even, which then can create uh, resentments, grievances, guilt, shame, and ultimately depression. So ultimately, even during COVID, all our AI research showed that uh, depression, anxiety, stress, and inflammation precede all chronic disease. So if for nothing else, for our personal well-being and our social well-being and our community well-being and our global planetary well-being, we need to look at this totally in terms of inflammation and disease and both physical and mental trauma. That's the way to actually approach it if people were willing to listen. And I think uh, we do have some global leaders who are moving in that direction right now. I think that uh, this kind of discussion is more important than ever. Uh, and the idea of fostering peace as the number one priority globally for each and every one of us internally, as well as around us, because we have to start with our own internal uh, peace journey um, is hugely important. I look forward to um, working on some of these initiatives with you in 2024. Uh, my last question for you is um, again, tying back to the book, and, and your work on quantum body, what is the main message or takeaway you hope readers can gain from quantum body and how can applying its principles really lead to a more peaceful and ultimately joyful life? I think each of us needs to maximize our own well-being. Um, and if, if we are peaceful, then we will be able to participate in the peace process. Peace can only be created by those who are peaceful, not necessarily by those who win Nobel Prizes for peace. Um, and um, it, just like love can only be expressed by those who have either been the recipients or givers of love. So we begin with ourselves. And if we are the uh, change we want to see in the world and we have a critical mass of that, then it extends to our families, to our communities, to our um, to our country and hopefully to the world. That's been the goal of the Chopra Foundation always, to reach a critical mass of consciousness for a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. And we have to start somewhere. So we start with ourselves. That's a great note to, uh, to end the, uh, the discussion. Um, I encourage everyone uh, watching to, to pick up the book, Quantum Body. It's, it's a really important and transformational book and to uh to check out and support the chopra foundation thank you so much my friend we'll uh we'll speak again shortly thank you jay thank Thanks. you